everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan, Ulrich, the whole, uh, the colleagues, the friends from the, from the Solidarity of Mexico. Um, cooperative, or what's the formal name? Colectivo. Colectivo de Solidaridad is the uh, Austria, con, con Mexico. I want to speak in Spanish, but I understand that, that many of you probably don't understand, understand Spanish, so it's probably better to do it in, in English to get the word out a little bit further. It's really a pleasure and an honor to, to be here with you. Mexico is a place of hope, and not of any old hope. Mexico is a site through which and at which uh, democracy itself, if we are victorious in Mexico, uh, can have expansive effect, I think, on the world. Mexico is in a strategic location in the world, and the battle for democracy in Mexico is the battle for democracy on the global uh, stage. Solidarity, not only solidarity, but standing together from Europe, Austria, and Mexico is particularly important today because the United States, we all know, is hypocritical about its commitment to human rights in the world, supports human rights in some places, in other places not, depending on its political interests and commitments. But this hypocrisy is particularly extreme in Mexico because Mexico shares a 2,000 mile border. Because Mexico will now be a provider of oil and natural gas to assure North American energy sovereignty and independence in an uh, increased uh, complex world for the United States in terms of oil. Because Mexico is necessary for the United States in terms of national security, migration, protection on this southern border. So, in Mexico, perhaps more than anywhere else in the world, perhaps even in Iraq, the policy of the United States towards Mexico will privilege stability over democracy, privilege interests over principles, Europe has the opportunity to look with a more objective, clear eye towards what is actually happening in Mexico. One of the reasons for the explosion and the successes of the Ayotzinapa mobilization has been because of specifically European solidarity. That's why it's so important and why I feel it's, so, it's such a privilege to be here to talk to you guys today. Um, and hopefully the questions and answers we can talk about larger philosophical and historical issues, but also about ways in which we can coordinate. Uh, this is a great opportunity to um, struggle for democracy once again in Mexico, but also on the global stage. Uh, I realize that not everybody knows about perhaps specific issues around the Yotinapa, so I would like to start there. For many of you it might be a repetition, but uh, we should go through just some basic facts about what happened on September 26th and what has happened since then. Um, then I'll try to place that in larger historical, geopolitical context, and then try to end on uh, a note of hope in terms of what's happening and what can happen in the future in Mexico. On September 26, 2014, two busloads of students, student activists, and this is very important because these were not any old students. These were student activists from one of the most important teacher training schools in Mexico. Teacher training schools which had been created after the Mexican Revolution of 1910, the Constitution of 1917, as centers for educating youth from indigenous peasant communities, as teachers and as social and community leaders, to give back to their communities and to develop and modernize their communities. In these schools, teacher training schools, were developed out of 
the idea, which is the inheritance of the Mexican Revolution itself, that we didn't need to bring in enlightenment from the outside, but that from inside these communities themselves, we would be able to form and create critical consciousness and education, in particularly in places like Guerrero, Oaxaca, Chiapas, the southern indigenous states of Mexico. These students are and were activists who had been particularly active in the context of the return of the old authoritarian party to power in 2012 and its structural reforms, which it uh, proposed and pushed through, reforms in, um, that are leading already towards the privatization of education, privatization of oil resources, um, fiscal reforms, banking reforms, labor reforms, all through a neoliberal agenda. These students were organizing that day, on September 26th, to transport themselves, they were trying to put together money and get buses to be able to transport themselves to Mexico City for the cel celebration, remembrance, the march of the October 2nd, 1968 student massacre. In 1968, October 2nd, hundreds, perhaps thousands of students were massacred, fired on in downtown Mexico City during a protest about political prisoners. Their major demand was the freedom for political prisoners. This was a few weeks before the inauguration of the Olympics in Mexico in 1968. These students, the students, came from Guerrero, organized them to participate in that march as they do every year, and were, according to the official account, brutally massacred in the city of Iguala in Guerrero. Now, Iguala is not a small town. It's a city with over 100,000 inhabitants. Um, this is not out in the middle of nowhere. This is an important regional city in Guerrero. According to the government, the 43 students were taken by local police, handed over to local drug lords, and burned alive during 15 hours during the following day of Saturday, September 27th, and no one noticed it, nor intervened. Now, it turned out, come to the knowledge of everybody, that on the night of September 26th, the federal military, the federal police, um, both intervened and had the students under observation even took photos of them, and at least did nothing if not actually participate in this act which can only be called a crime against humanity. The burning of 43 students for no reason. Uh, we can suspect political, other reasons, but for no reason, humane reason, um, is equivalent to a Holocaust scenario, nothing else. We can't put it in any other, other category other than crime against humanity. Now, the government is probably lying. This is the worst part about it. Um, and if they're lying about it, it puts us into a difficult situation. Now, why, why do we think that, that they're lying? There's plenty of evidence out there. Scientists have come forth to demonstrate that that day it was raining. And that in order to have incinerated 47 bodies, 43 bodies, um, it would have created an enormous bonfire which would have been noticed for miles, would have showed up on the NASA radars. It would have left an incredible destruction of, uh, of, uh, of the, the, the context itself. This was supposedly in a, in, a, in a garbage dump, but even then it would have completely transformed the topography of the area. None of this happened. The federal government didn't respond until 10 days later. Actually, the, the, head, the, 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 the mayor of Iguala stuck around. He didn't even skip down that day. The next day, he was still around. Until a few days later, he got a phone call. They said, oh, lots of international attention on this. You better get out of town to, until things calm down. The government story is absolutely unbelievable. But what that makes us think 
is that the situation is somehow worse. Why would the federal government make up such a disastrous, terrible story? Unbelievable story. The only possible explanation for that is that the reality is probably even worse. Um, what's worse? And this is, what is the federal government trying to protect? We don't know. But all evidence points directly towards the military or the federal police. The federal military has two enormous bases in Iwala. I was in Iwala uh, four weeks ago on February 24th. You see, as you're going into town, the 35th Battalion and the 26th Battalion are North Base. They've been there for decades. Guerrero is the place where the Mexican dirty wars took place during the 70s. Uh, you hear about the dirty wars in Argentina, in Chile, in which dissidents, political dissidents, were thrown out of airplanes, were assassinated, disappeared. Mexico was somehow supposedly an exception. In Mexico, there wasn't the same kind of authoritarian coup, basically because the idea or the impression is because Mexico was always led by civilian presidents. There wasn't a direct military junta. But it turns out, recent information has come up, which demonstrated that Mexico we had the same phenomenon, particularly in Guerrero. Thousands of militants, there was a guerrilla movement going on, led by Leonardo Vasquez and Lucio Cabanos, Cabanas, who are graduates of the Ayotzinapa Teachers College. In the 1970s, they were killed, and their colleagues were thrown out of airplanes over the ocean, just like in Argentina and Chile, Brazil. Today, we are going through a rerun of the 60s, of the 70s. This is why the situation is so important. It's not just a situation of local drug lords and corrupt municipal presidents and cahoots with them who eliminate some uncomfortable students. This is why it's grown so big in Mexico internationally because what this implies is that Mexico is not a democracy. If the political system can knock out 43 kids and disappear them literally off the planet, Although there is hope, and um, this is the demand for the, the parents of these 43 kids, that the kids appear. Vivos se los llevaron, vivos los queremos. We have not given up in the search for the students, and this is the central demand of the parents. But this context is obviously a representation of the complete continuity of authoritarianism in Mexico. And it shouldn't be a surprise. Many of us anticipated, expected this, when on December 1st, 2012, the old authoritarian party of the institutional revolution, the PRI, came back in power. On December 1st, 2012, there was a return of bloody transitions of power. In the year 2000 and 2006, we had serious problems with elections, particularly in 2006, but at the end of one sexenio, one presidential um, uh, mandate, the former president handed over the presidency to the new president without violence occurring, without any blood being spread. In 2012, this changed. On December 1st, 2012, the students who had already been protesting earlier, the Yo Soy 132 movement, heard of them, perhaps, many of them themselves came out and protested on December 1st, 2012, at the Congress, where Benito was going to take, although in order to avoid being stopped while he's doing it, he actually did it the night beforehand in a secret ceremony in and the Palacio Nacional, which was televised, but protected. The next day he had to go to the Congress. And that day, during those protests, uh, a community leader who did street theater, uh, Jose Francisco Coyquenda, was killed by the federal police. Shot at with, uh, not clear in the end whether it was rubber bullets or 
or whether it was a, a, a tear gas container, probably the latter. His head was opened, he went into coma, a year later he died. Another student activist lost an eye, Uriel Sandoval. Dozens of student activists were arbitrarily grabbed from the streets and thrown to jail. Some had to spend over a year in jail. All were freed at the end because they had committed no crime. This was the announcement of the pre that it was bad, that it was not going to tolerate opposition. It immediately brought in all of the parties, the dominant parties, through cooptation, into something called the Pact for Mexico, which was celebrated by the Washington Post, the Financial Times, because finally all the parties are coming together to agree on policy. But the real purpose and actual effect of this Pact for Mexico was to eliminate the Congress as an opposing um, accountability force, or, uh, oversight force. One of the few institutions which had democratized between 1997 and 2012 was the Congress. They questioned the president, they were doing investigations of the president, of the executive branch in general, stopping the budget, reviewing, reviewing, reviewing the budget. But as of December 1st, all that was out, was out the door. And you could see it quickly that energy reform, which for instance changed Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution, which is the most important article of the Mexican Constitution coming from 1917, was modified uh, in the Congress without any debate. Passed two-thirds of the Senate, two-thirds of the House, and was passed by a majority of the state legislatures in 10 days. Some of those state legislatures took three minutes to pass the most important constitutional reform in recent history of Mexico. Freedom of the press, since de December 1st, 2012, has been under constant attack. Just on Tuesday, Article 19 branch in Mexico um, published their new 2014 report, and attacks against the press have doubled since the arrival of Enrique Peña Nieto and the PRI on December 1st. 2012. The recent firing of Carmen State, which I see your picture up there, some people uh, um, protesting, uh, her firing from a, uh, which in another context could be a normal commercial dispute between a, a, a journalist and, a, and the radio station that contacts her, is not that at all in Mexico today. This is a clear act of direct censorship. Carmen Aristegui is the most popular and the only journalist in television and radio. There are plenty of us who are in newspapers and magazines. I, I used to be in TV and radio interviews frequently. Many of us were. But as of December 1st, 2012, Carmen Aristegui was and is the only journalist who every day would expose corruption, conflicts of interest in the federal government. This was not to be tolerated. And Daniel Nieto de Pri waited for the precise moment, particularly now, a week, two weeks before the beginning of the federal electoral campaigns, which will take place in federal elections, midterm elections will take place in June, um, to fire on trumped up uh, ridiculous charges. This is an example, just as the Yotsunapa case is an example, a particularly aggressive example, of a larger context of censorship and repression. People think that in Mexico, for instance, there's more free press than in Venezuela, for instance, because in Venezuela they have a large state-run sector of television, while in Mexico everything's private. Well, it turns out that mass privatization can be just as bad for freedom of press as public control. Because in Mexico we have two television stations which control what news is, a few families who control the radio, and um, in Venezuela you can find people frontally criticizing um, Maduro and Chavez before, the president of Venezuela. They might end up going to jail, some of them. I'm not defending through the press in Venezuela, although there is a plural debate and discussion about the executive branch. 
In Mexico, there is none. Carmen de was the only person who would bring out scandals against the president. Now, there is no one. You watch Mexican television and radio, absolutely nobody dares to bring out scandals or frontally criticize the president and his party. This is a totalitarian system, a dictatorial system. How much time do we have to? Is it time to get to the optimistic side? <laughs> <laughs> it's been more than 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. Let me just go quickly to the, uh, the question of... Uh, uh, so why is this the case? Right? Is it just a question of backwards, corrupt political culture and politicians in Mexico and undeveloped countries and Latin American countries like that? No. This is a structural problem. And one of the major problems is the issue of organized crime and narco-trafficking. Getting to the title of this talk about the narco estado in Mexico. Between 9 and 29 billion dollars enter into the Mexican economy each year. That's between 1 and 3 percent of the uh, GDP. Uh, you can see that the broad range of estimates shows how little we actually know. We don't even have good information on this. Between 9 and 29 billion dollars. This money is laundered through a wide diversity of, of, man, of ways. The Mexican government and the United States government do little to nothing to stop it. It ends up in HSBC, Geneva, or there's a recent scandal involving directly HSBC in Mexico. Uh, it ends up funding politicians. The spending limits for the presidential campaign of 2012 was 336,000 million pesos, which is about $25 million. Okay? So $25 million was the spending limit for the president's campaign. It's very reasonable. We have a good electoral law in Mexico. It's not supposed to be like the United States in which money buys votes. It's supposed to be more like France or perhaps Austria, I don't know the system, but um, in which there's a control over this public sphere. It's not about money campaigns, it's about ideas and debate, supposedly. Well, here, a recent legislative commission brought out uh, a conservative estimate that Enrique Peña Nieto overspent those spending limits by 12 times. Instead of $25 million, he spent uh, $350 million. Nine to $29 billion coming in each year, being washed through the system. Would it really imply an important cost to this um, money being, um, to these organized crime rings to um, help out with $300 million? for an electoral campaign. It would be naive to think that this didn't happen. Peña Nieto and the federal government have been saying this is all a localized issue. That's the local government who are corrupt and in the pocket of the, of the, of the organized crime. They've forgotten to mention one very important legal fact, which is that organized crime, narco-trafficking, forced disappearance are federal crimes. Independently of who commits them, it could be a, any local mayor or any local article. But the, or, the organization which is responsible for enforcing, preventing, punishing these crimes are federal institutions. That's why there are military bases, supposedly, in, in Guerrero. That's why the federal police is there. It would be naive to imagine that somehow the narcos would be more interested in funding local campaigns and somehow not be concerned about the federal campaigns. And it's not even necessary to draw direct links. The Mexican economy is so narcotized, so full of money laundering, that um, it's impossible to draw the lines and to see where one dollar, a dirty dollar starts and a, and a clean dollar begins. That's one of the reasons why nothing has been done about this. Because there are a lot of decent businessmen 
implies all of this. And when you link that to the blind support of the United States government for the Mexican political class and their total lack of concern for human rights or corruption, insofar as the Mexican government um, complies with their demands, you have a situation, a structural situation, in which the Mexican government is, uh, if you want to be naive about it or optimistic, is trapped. Or on the other hand, in which the federal government is literally not interested in the Mexican people. They give account to other external actors. And that would be a more logical hypothesis based on what's happened in the last few months. The federal government has shown an incredible lack of capacity to respond to, in a flexible and creative manner, this legitimacy and corruption crisis and human rights crisis. They've done nothing. They've continued on with business as usual. In exactly the same way as they have done for the last 86 years. The PRI was supposedly out of power for 12 years, between 2012, but they weren't. During those 12 years, the local governors of the PRI consolidated their power. And in 2012, those local governors of the PRI, who never left power, took over the federal government. Enrique Peña Nieto and Emilio Chorfet uh, so are ex-governors of the state of Mexico, which today has been ruled by the PRI for 86 years. Murillo Cara y Osorio Chong son are from the state of Hidalgo, another state, which ex-governor of the state of Hidalgo, but another state who has, that has not undergone even democratic alternation in power. Things are the same at the level of the power structure. And here, I'm running out of time, but let's go to the optimistic side. <laughs> Mexican society has changed. Mexican society is not the same as it was 100 years ago during the revolution, in which literacy rates were 20-30%, now they're 95%. It's not even the same as it was in the 60s or in the 80s. Mexicans are much better educated from smaller families, more independence, more informed through social networks, through international networks. Mexico had itself has internationalized. One of the central motors for the international solidarity which has come up last fall is people from Europe, the United States, but Mexicans abroad. There are Mexicans everywhere. <laughs> Young, old, professionals who have from all different classes in the United States who have expanded throughout the world and who are concerned about their homeland and are willing to do what they can to recuperate institutional strength and democracy and development for Mexico. Over the last four years in a row, each year, there has been a major social uprising. In 2011, the Movimiento por la Paz, con Justicia y Dignidad, the Movement for Peace led by Javier Cecilia, which just yesterday, uh, the 25th, had its fourth anniversary. Led an, an impressive movement all throughout Mexico and in the United States as well in defense of the victims of the drug war. In 2012, there was an incredible student uprising with the Yo Soy Centro movement. Unprecedented. It was in the middle of an electoral campaign. It's normal to see students protesting against, you know, presidents who have been elected or even against. Uh, politicians, but in the middle of a campaign, a month and a, six weeks before the election, all of a sudden there was a major student movement against one of the candidates. And it wasn't an electoral movement, it was just against the return of the pre. In 2013, there was a major uprising of teachers, and from that point, at that point they were even beforehand, but then even the Ayotzinapa students were very important as teachers in training. The, te the teachers movement and in general the movement against the structural reforms, the privatization of oil in 2013. In 2014, the first half, we had a very important movement in Michoacán with the autodefensas, and in the second half of 2014, the incredible national, international response with an integration of city and countryside, very important, coming together in response to the Yotzinapa disappearances. Each year, each one of these movements accumulates and grows in strength. 
The present situation today in Mexico is unsustainable. I had some uh, statistics and stuff, but I don't have time to show it to you. But if you look at Latin Barometer, for instance, Mexico is the country, other than Guatemala, of the, the big countries in Latin America, it is the country in which the, the, the population expresses the least level of satisfaction in democracy. Only 21% of Mexicans are satisfied with their democracy. Confidence in the system, in the po political parties, confidence in the political parties was already low, but now has gone down to 7%. Nobody believes that Mexico is even a democracy. People, traditional political scientists, complain about this. Oh, this means that the Mexican political culture is authoritarian. They don't trust their leaders. They don't trust their institutions. But no. No, no. Mexican society is sick and tired of the same old show. We've had elections for over 100 years. But the UDS won eight elections. Victor Diaz. We, we, we're not um, fooled by elections. We want more. We want real democracy. Mexico, the Mexican people is, uh, you could say, more cynical or more optimistic and more demanding than other populations in the world. And this is what we keep on seeing year after year. Now, there's a danger here. You have a totally blind and deaf government, um, supported by very powerful interests in Washington, international oil companies, um, in um, organized crime. And on the other hand, you have an increasingly aware, active, and um, participative population. Uh, this, I say, is unsustainable because the, uh, it looks like, Mexico looks like Venezuela before Chavez, or Bolivia before Evo Morales, or Ecuador before Rafael Correa, or Brazil. Color de Melo before, before and, and, and later before Lula. Uh, I don't know if we'll get a Chavez or Nevo or Lula da Silva or uh, Uribe or Mexico something different. Ooh, something else will happen. But something is going to happen. The danger is increased militarization, increased re uh, repression, increased violation of human rights, increased corruption, all with the undying support of the United States. The other option is a democratic spring, an awakening of the spirit of the world historical Mexican revolution of 1910, the constitution of 1917, which for the 20th century is what the Declaration of the Rights of Man was for the 18th century. The Mexican constitution of 1917, still in effect today, is one of the great constitutions of the modern age. With international solidarity, with participation of Mexico, Mexicans in Mexico and outside, we can and we must construct a new um, uh, dynamic and equilibrium for democratic politics in Mexico. But it depends on all of us, all of you, everybody um, playing their part. Thank you very much. ask him some questions. I will just uh, remind you one thing, we have very little time, so please uh, keep short and uh, so give it, uh, some of you can uh, ask some questions. And please understand we can pick up each other question. Go ahead. Yes, um, when they took the students, uh, well, the official uh, version is that uh, the wife of the mayor of Iguala was having a speech and she was angry because they took the students. And that's why they were made to secure. And this is obviously a ridiculous story. Why do you think they took them? I propose to collect three or four questions at a time and then go back to the channel.
they are richer. And I think, why the, in Mexico is not possible to do that? One last question. Uh, in your opinion, which would be the most important reforms that need to be done to the Constitution in order we can have a, a better situation? Okay, big questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, why did they think the students? Because the students were a threat. Um, the Ayutthaya students uh, are uh, hold back of uh, an age which is supposed to be, have over, been overcome by modernization. Uh, they represent and they act in function, in function de, I'm sorry, I think they say that, <laughs> for the purpose of, 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 uh, of reviving and reinstalling the, uh, the, the fundamental principles of the Mexican Revolution, of justice and equality. And they have been very active and militant, um, blocking highways, participating in marches, protesting against the education reform, the oil reform. Um, they are and were a threat to the system. Whether the federal government directly ordered in this particular day that they be eliminated, I don't know. I, I, as the time goes by and the stories get more and more convoluted and unbelievable, I start to think that that might actually be the case. Uh, but at least they have been so vilified and uh, um, excluded politically and socially that they were uh, um, uh, sitting targets. Nobody thought that anything would happen because they were um, not necessary for the system. They had been consistently vilified and, and demonized, is the word I'm looking for, uh, by the media, by the local government officials. Uh, and so they were dispensable for the system. But uh, it turns out that um, society did not agree with that um, judgment. And that's what's so marvelous about the response to the assassination, that we're seeing that, or the disappearance, sorry, that we're seeing People not only from Guerrero or from rural or indigenous areas of Guerrero, but from all over the world, um, defending um, not only the Ayutthaya students, but what they represent and their legacy, and uh, the legacy which still continues to be today of the Mexican Revolution. In terms of the time it takes for changes, did I say 20 years? I don't think I said 20 years. I, I hope it happened before that. Um, I think it's, what I'm saying is that the situation today is unsustainable. Uh, I don't think it'll be 20 years. Something's going to happen soon. Something's already happened. Um, in Michoacan, for instance, uh, the new representative for the federal government is a uh, military general who, uh, four or five star general who studied at the School of the Americas in the United States. That same School of the Americas which trained um, the military of Central America during the 70s and 80s. He's not just a military representative in that sector, he's the direct representative of the federal government in Michoacan. We, and he's basically acting as if he were uh, the governor of Michoacan. We already have a military leader in Michoacan. In Guerrero, if somehow the elections were canceled, uh, the first step would be for Enrique Peña Nieto to submit to the Senate or have approved uh, someone linked to the military or security establishment as interim governor of Guerrero. Historically, one of the great legacies of the Mexican Revolution has been the separation, the, the pact between military and civilian authorities. Mexico has avoided, throughout the 20th century, the military coups and the instability, authoritarian instability, of course, I'm not trying to do any apology for the past, but one of the exceptional things about 20th century Mexican political history is that we didn't have the politicization of the military as has occurred, for instance, in the Southern Cone. Um, that's changing. So things are already happening. 
And the response, the social responses are already also happening. The last four years, as I was saying, year by year. Uh, this will be not definitively resolved, but something, some resolution will have to come over the next two or three years. Uh, Mexico always, its political progress is always marked by the electoral calendar. Not because elections are particularly important, but because yeah, they're, because they're sort of symbolic periods of six years. Um, between now and 2018, um, I think will be the crucial time to see what will, uh, it's a historic moment in terms of defining what Mexico will be in the future. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. The self-defense forces in, well, the, the, the Michoacan groups are called autodefensa, self-defense. In Guerrero, the policías comunitarios, although there's some of each in each one of the other states. It's interesting, they're neighboring states, but they have very different um, economic, social, political histories. And uh, there's a different trajectory in each one of those, those two states. It's too complicated to get, talk about it now. Uh, in Guerrero, uh, the uh, community police have been very active and have been defending their autonomy to uh, defend themselves uh, against both local police and the narcos. And they've been very successful in consolidating power and have even moved towards, not directly the police, but linked to community groups to actually taking over municipal government, creating sort of autonomous government similar to those in Chiapas. In Michoacán, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, they, the, some, one thesis is that at least part of the self-defense groups was at least encouraged by the federal government. When Peña Nieto came in, one of his first things, actually before he was elected, as a, actually responding to orders from Washington, he hired as a special advisor for uh, public security and narco traffic and organized crime, Oscar Naranjo, who used to be the head of police in Colombia under Uribe, and is a special DEA agent, you know, recognized by the United States government. Uh, and Oscar Naranjo is known for his involvement in this kind of tactics. And so one of the theories is that Michoacan, the self-defense group, were originally supported and created by the state, but they got out of control for the state itself, in actually a good way. So Mireles, who obviously had a, a positive relationship with government authorities during a while, um, decided to become more independent and actually defend his people. When he did that, he was immediately thrown into jail. Um, and he is obviously a political forensic prisoner because of that, as well as dozens of other self-defense forces. Uh, it's, a, it's very difficult to see in any of the context, but you know, who the good guys and the bad guys are in Michoacan, but there's a there is a, a, an intense process both of the government trying to use the strategy of sort of independent forces to do what it can't do in terms of violating human rights, um, and, but there is also within Michoacan uh, a very much a, an organic community process of self-defense similar to what happened in Guerrero. Um, and so Michoacan is, is definitely very much of a hotspot like, like Guerrero, uh, and also in the end, uh, a space of, for hope in, in terms of if the society, if society can, can organize itself and, and, and defend itself effectively. Uh, the last question, I didn't write it down, what was it? Right, that was the last one. That was the last one? No, no. Oh, there's one more. No, no. Oh, what reforms? Oh, oh, what reforms? Yes, sorry. What reforms do I suggest? Uh, <laughs> listen, the, the, the problem is that in Mexico we always want to solve all of our problems through legal and constitutional reforms. Right? So, uh, we want clean elections, electoral reform. We want to combat corruption, corruption reform. We want uh, to privatize oil, um, oil reform. Um, both the good and the bad side of all this is that the legal reforms don't usually, uh, are, are not the solution. They, they, there was a hope during the 90s and the, and the, and the last decade that we built to really consolidate that democratic transition through legal and constitutional reform. I think that hope is gone. Uh, the, the real possibility for the future is political change. And not only in government, but outside of government. Um, the construction of a, a, a wide social political coalition who can take over power both in and out of government and change the way in which the institutions function. We have wonderful institutions in Mexico. The, the, the electoral institute, the electoral law, there's even a, there's going to be a new anti-corruption institution. There's supposed to be an autonomous attorney general soon. We have, we have all these great institutions. The problem is that those institutions are controlled by uh, a, 
a group of politicians who have absolutely no interest in the people. Perhaps it sounds a little reductionist and simple, but that's uh, the reality. And uh, we really need a political movement. There's uh, some people express hope, for instance, in, in Morena, which is a, a new political party. Others in independent social movements. The, the, the Ayotzinapa parents and students have called for, for instance, um, boycotting the elections, uh, the June 7th elections. Um, other movements uh, don't have to take business, business on that one way or the other, but are trying to construct uh, a new constitution, for instance, as a, a process for a, a citizen constitution. All these initiatives are, are great. The, the, the real challenge is, over the next few years, trying to put together some sort of coalition that can lead to a political change and system. It can't just be a, an electoral coalition. Um, it has to be a, a much broader social coalition. And that's the real hope for, for Mexico. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, seven, eight minutes uh, more. Should we cut now? Yeah. Uh, okay, but we'll take uh, three short questions uh, and kind of words, and then we go outside. Uh, so we okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, my question has to do also um, with this event here today, for example. And the thing is, uh, we see every time there is like uh, all this very terrifying news and sometimes it seems like it's uh, getting worse and worse and that um, yeah, spaces to speak and uh, yeah, expression, free expression is getting lost and freedom and um, yeah, it's very terrible par panorama and my question is what is the role of um, yeah, if, is there external instances that may have um, um, uh, a role in pushing a change? What is the role of the international um, institutions and instances? And yeah, well, I want to keep that. Mostly. Mm -hmm. Two more questions. Uh, women first. Thank you. <laughs> so you said it before uh, yourself that in Mexico, uh, we have a different situation from 20 years ago and I agree with you in that matter that we young people are more informed, especially in social media. Um, regarding that, uh, what, is the, what is your uh, perspective or what is your prediction for the upcoming elections? And do you think that we can rely on this new political party uh, Morena, uh, does it provide, um, I don't know, any kind of hope? And also rega regarding uh, Carmen Aristegui, uh, what is um, the future in journalism in Mexico? Uh, should we as society rely on the social media or what can, uh, what can we do or what can expect from her own situation? Uh, because we don't have any other uh, good journalists anymore. So there are two questions actually, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so we have one last question. I, I'll take this, sorry for you. I just wanted to ask if you could have a comment on the ability of the Peninsula electric cohesion to Gremios and syndicates, for example. So there's like some parts of the population that keep their privileges and keep both of them. Uh -huh. and The last question. Go ahead. I have seen some words about the actual status of the Zapatista movement, uh -huh. because in Europe uh, you have the impression that they lost importance dramatically. So, what what role do or what role can they play in this overall struggle for the organization and political change? Thank you. Um, so, the role of international solidarity. Given the scenario that I'm painting, international solidarity, specifically European from Europe, is absolutely essential to stop the worst scenario. The only thing, perhaps, that will stop the entrenchment of military repressive response to social mobilization is international solidarity. Um, no matter how many people get out of the streets, 
that in and of itself is not going to stop them grabbing 11 students in number 20 and sending them to, them to maximum security prison just to scare the living daylights out, right? Um, that's not, the only thing that, that would stop them, what got the kids out of jail was international attention. So that's really an essential rule. And once you stop that, then the rest of it will happen, not by itself, but will happen quite um, productively. Uh, but really, that's an absolutely crucial rule. If we don't continue to have the international solidarity to stop the, the, the military repressive response, um, it'll be hard to have an optimistic uh, um, view of the future. In terms of the elections of 2015, on November 7th, there'll be elections. There'll be elections for the governor of Guerrero. There'll be federal in, in another uh, dozen states throughout the country, municipal elections, and there'll be elections for the federal, uh, just one house, the, the, the House of Camarillo de Taos, right? The, the, the Chamber of Deputies. In these elections, the pre, and this gets to we can tie into the question, the most recent polls, now it's kind of hard to talk about polls because these pollsters are like everything else in the Mexican political system. So for instance, in the 2012 elections, this same pollster, which I'm going to cite right now, Parametria, put Peña Nieto ahead by 20%, right? and then he ended up winning by winning, right, by six. Um, they obviously inflated the numbers. So even this pollster, who normally inflates um, support for the government, uh, recognizes that the level of support today for the PRI is 21% of the population. Answer on a poll that they will vote for the PRI in these elections. Uh, even more say they don't know, 28%. Uh, there's, so it's actually quite low. What the PRI has done is gone to its old strategy of creating little satellite parks or helping, having, supporting satellite parties so that they can um, catch the anti-pre vote. No? <laughs> Recycle the pre vote. So the new party, it's not new actually, they've been doing this for a while before that, but now they're particularly putting energy into it, is the Green Party, right? Here in Europe, Green Party sounds pretty cool, right? That's, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, you know, really open-minded, critical party, but no, the, pre -party, the Green Party in Mexico is like the worst of the worst. This is a, this is a, this is not a Green Party, this is a, a group of uh, a family, it's a family business basically, and uh, which is receiving lots of money from the PRI and from who knows where else um, to pump up its public image to capture with a sort of a modern youthful image, the idea is to capture some of that anti-PRI vote. But even that demonstrates that the PRI is in dire straits, it's in weak position, but it has to do that. Although, uh, that will probably allow it to, with the, the, the Green Party along with the PRI, to, to maintain its hegemony over uh, party's politics even after the midterm elections. The problem here is that there's a division within the opposition movement itself, uh, between voting or not voting uh, on June 7th. So, uh, those who are against voting think that uh, having an election or voting or participating in elections to express one's complicity with the system and to allow the government to use elections to, to get over the past, you know, through a, you know, a new legitimation process, and move toward the future. Other people say that um, Morena, this new party, actually represents something different, and that it's worth voting for Morena as an alternative. Um, I'm in the second camp. I think that Morena is not perfect. Um, Lopez Obrador, who is the leader of Morena, is not a candidate this year. Uh, he is the president of the party, but it's important. A lot of people are in favor against him. He's sort of a, uh, people would debate about that a lot. But he's not a candidate. This year, 2015, Morena has put forth lots of very interesting candidates. The candidate for the governor of, of Guerrero is very interesting, Pablo Sandoval. The candidates for federal legislature, a colleague of mine, Jaime Cárdenas from the Institute for Legal Research, who was, a, who was an electoral counselor in the end of the 90s, one of the most critical defenders of, of democracy, is a candidate for Morena. Uh, Virgilio Caballero, one of the great journalists, um, who has constructed independent um, television stations for decades as a candidate for Morena. These are people who are actually independent, honest people. They're not going to save Mexico. They're not going to save the world. Um, but in the end, change will have to happen from society. But as someone from society, I prefer a million times to sit down and negotiate or protest or, uh, or insult even, um, you know, Jaime Cárdenas or Virgilio Caballero 
or Carmen Salinas, right? Carmen Salinas is a television actress who's the candidate for the PRI. She's a ridiculous, like not particularly highbrow television um, uh, 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 actress. And, uh, or Gautemo Gutierrez, the, the, the king of trash. He's, he's the son of the head of the, 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 the trash collectors uh, union of Mexico City. I mean, there's no comparison. It, it, they're not the same. I don't want to say that Morena is the solution. Um, I don't think that party politics or elections are necessarily the solution. But um, we need to make my position is that at least for these months, we should make a strategic alliance with Morena, make sure that we get at least some people into government, even uh, uh, to state government, that would be amazing, or at least to have a serious presence in the Congress, so that we have at least some sort of opposition, institutionalized opposition. Because that's what the PRI does not tolerate. Opposition. That's why they fired Carmen Aristegui. That's why they signed the pact for Mexico. That's why they killed the students. Or disappeared the students. Because they don't tolerate opposition. These guys are governors from states who the PRI has ruled for 86 years. They don't know what democracy opposition is about. So our responsibility is to work together to make sure that there's as many centers of opposition as possible in the world. In Mexico. In the world, of course, but in Mexico. In government. In Congress. In state governments, in society, in universities, everywhere, in, in unions, we need to um, support each other to make sure that there's some sort of opposition. Um, finally, the Zapatista movement. Uh, the Zapatista movement today is, has actually been revived through the Ayutinapa mobilization. The Ayutinapa parents and students went to Chiapas they've met. Um, in many ways, what's happening today in Guerrero in terms of autonomous municipalities is being modeled on what the Zapatistas uh, have done in Chiapas. Uh, the, the big problem with what happened to the Zapatistas is that uh, because of government strategies, and also, to be self-critical here, because of their own strategies, they never were successful in articulating a national political project. It ended up being quite successful for defending the autonomy in, in in Chiapas, there's very important experiences of progress and democracy and development in Chiapas. Um, but, uh, for instance, the governor of Chiapas is uh, a kid from the Green Party, right? who is just as bad or worse as the old um, governors uh, who Albores and the guys who was just killed out, uh, kicked out, kicked out, sorry, in the in the 90s. Um, once again, it's not like we can measure success or failure with regard to you know, what happens in the political sphere. We have a different sphere, the social and political spheres, but that's just a little indication of the effect that the PRI is back in power. Um, that's also the, the fault of the PRD and of other people as well, but the fact that 20 years later, we're still talking about the same political system, well, yes, something, something went wrong, not only on the party's, party politics side, but also on the side of social movement. Um, and we need to learn from that, and we need to, the next 20 years, over the next two or three years, um, we need to, on the party politics side, get closer to movements, and movements also open up and be more plural. I think that's what we need to really learn from over the last 20 years and, and be inspired by them. The Zapatistas are still very much alive today as an example, um, and as a, but they're not alive as a national political force, um, although they're becoming alive again through the Zayuchinapa um, context, and that's, a, that's good news. Thank you very much.